New Year's is a time for parties, watching the ball drop in Central Park, counting down the seconds before midnight, turning the calendar for a whole new year. I did see uh, last night where in Sydney, Australia, uh, one of the first places to celebrate uh, New Year's, uh, they had exploded tens of thousands of fireworks as part of their uh, celebration of the New Year. Of course, that was all true if you're young enough to stay up till midnight. A lot of us just pack it in at bedtime and figure it'll be there when we awake in the morning. Uh, or if you were in Maroa last night at midnight, uh, you were awakened by fireworks set off there in town uh, that let everybody know that it was New Year's. But many take this time to reflect on the past year and perhaps project into the year that awaits. And one fixture that we have in our culture is New Year's resolutions. With the start of a new year, we promise ourselves, maybe others, to adopt new habits, maybe to break old habits, to try to become a better person. And I think all this is well and good, except that New Year's resolutions have become notorious for being short-lived. This is reflected in the opening lines of a song recorded by Carolyn Aaron some years ago entitled New Year's Day. She sings, I buy a lot of diaries, fill them with good intentions. Each and every New Year's Eve, I make myself a list. All the things I'm going to change till January 2nd. <laughs> For whatever reason, we tend to not follow through on these promises we make to ourselves. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons why this happens. Sometimes the goals are just unrealistic. We might resolve that we're going to run a marathon, and we've never even run around the block, right? Or they're unmeasurable. You know, I'm going to be a nicer person this year. How do you know if you've accomplished that, right? And even as Christians, we tend to make New Year's resolutions. I'm going to read the Bible every day, somebody might pledge. Or I'm going to get up earlier in the morning and spend more time in prayer. But even with these well-intentioned resolutions, we often find ourselves victim of that old biblical saying, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so New Year's resolutions has taken a negative tone for many. One person quipped, New Year's resolutions are like friends. They're easier to make than to keep. <clears throat> Another said, New Year's resolution, resolution usually goes in one year and out the other. And, and that's true for many of us. But on this January 1st, I'd like to take a new look at New Year's, and particularly this idea of New Year's resolutions. I want to consider why resolutions are often not kept, but also some encouraging truth from Scripture that can give us a new perspective and hope for this new year. So let's begin with the, the practice of disappointing resolutions. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution, and within a few days or even a few weeks, it's already broken? You're not alone. Researchers have discovered that 25% of all New Year's resolutions are abandoned within the first week. Don't even make it through a week, and they're already history. 60% are gone within six months. Of those who fail, a majority will make the same resolution year after year up to 10 years before they finally just give up. Another survey of 200 people that made New Year's resolutions sincerely resolving to better themselves in certain areas of their lives revealed that by the end of January, half of them had completely broken their resolutions entirely and none of the 200 made it through the year. Now, you turn to the Bible, you won't find the phrase New Year's resolutions. They didn't have that wording back then. But what you find is a subject of a vow. 
and vows were very serious in the life of the people of Israel. I'd like to look in the Old Testament, first in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 30. Numbers is the fourth book in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 1. Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, This is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to oblige himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. God takes vows, promises, very seriously. In the very next book, Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, beginning in verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to repay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. And then in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, Solomon reflects this same idea. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger saying, My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hand? Now you may hear that and say, okay, I'm not making any vows. I'm not making any promises. New Year's resolutions are out the window. And that would be the safe way to go. But I'm not sure that's the best way. I'm not suggesting that we not make promises, make resolutions, whatever you want to call them, in order to better ourselves as people. But I think we all would agree that we've had the experience of these disappointing resolutions. We make them and we break them. And some of you might be wondering, why is that? Why is that such a thing? I believe the Bible gives us the answer to that as well. For that, let's turn to the New Testament, book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. In this passage, I think the Apostle Paul opens himself up. He's very vulnerable in revealing something about himself that I think we can all relate to. Beginning in verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil that I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the, the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my mind. Then he concludes in verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? You can hear the frustration. You can hear the disappointment. Paul is saying, I try to do the right thing, and I don't do it. And those things I don't want to do, those are the things I just keep on doing. Anybody had that experience? You don't have to say amen, because I know you all have. We all have. We've all done it. Even if we don't make New Year's resolutions, this is still our experience. And I don't share this so that we give up hope. 
It's just being very realistic about ourselves. It's not easy to change. It's not easy to grow. And it's not automatically successful. Why is that? Well, I think there's some practical reasons. We've touched on a couple already. Sometimes our goals are unrealistic. Sometimes they're more dependent on others than ourselves, or they may lie outside the realm of our control. But I think the biggest reason why our resolutions fail is that we depend on our own willpower to carry it through. And that willpower is what most of us lack. We still struggle with that sin nature, and we find it's more comfortable to go back to the old habits, the old way of living, instead of moving forward in Christ. Now, scholars argue whether that passage in Romans 7, whether Paul wrote those from the perspective of someone who was saved, or is this before they were saved? I believe he was saved in this testimony because he says in verse 18 in i have the desire to do what's good and i don't think that you can really say that about somebody outside of christ in my inner being i delight in god's law really someone who's unsaved is going to say that? i don't think so i really believe paul was confessing his experience as a believer when he's trying to do it on his own Now, I think Romans 7 would be one of the most tragic, depressing chapters in all the Bible if it weren't for the last verse. Look at verse 25. Paul concludes, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He had just cried out, Who can rescue me from this body of sin? And then he gives the answer. Jesus can do it. And if we were to go on into chapter 8 of that same letter, Paul then talks about life in the Spirit and how the Spirit gives us the power to do what is right, to live according to God's will. It can be done, but it must be done in His power and in His strength. So there is hope. There is victory. There is the possibility of change. And I'm talking about lasting change in the life of the Christian. That possibility of change lies in the promise of divine renewal. Simply put, we have hope when we allow God to do what we cannot do for ourselves. You know, one of the most amazing passages of hope you find anywhere in Scripture is in the most unlikely place. It was read for us earlier in our Scripture. Lamentations, chapter 3. I want to ask you, how many of you have ever heard a series of sermons preached through the book of Lamentations? How many of you have ever heard a sermon preached through the book of Lamentations? Maybe. That's not a part of the Bible we're real familiar with. And there's a reason for that. It's depressing. Even the name of the book means funeral songs. Oh yeah, that's something I want to turn to every morning, right? It was written by Jeremiah, who was called the weeping prophet. And you can almost sense the tear stains on the pages as you read this book. To give you an idea of the background, this was written after the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple had been ransacked and demolished. The walls of the city were torn down. Many of the houses were torn down and burned. Many of the people were killed. Others were taken away into exile. And here is Jeremiah walking through the streets of his city, seeing the devastation pouring out his heart. I think of somebody today, maybe from the nation of Ukraine, in a city that's been shelled by the Russians, maybe overrun by their troops. And now they're walking through and they're seeing their hometown destroyed. Lives crushed. 
and he's being very open and honest. He says, oh, that my eyes were a fountain that the tears would come out. Very, very depressing book. Right in the middle, we see this ray of sunshine break through the clouds. I want to turn to that passage right after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 19 and 20 really set the stage. Jeremiah writes, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness of all. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. I really liked the translation that Bob used this morning because in that verse it says I'm depressed. They didn't have the word depression in ancient Hebrew. Downcast is it. It's exactly what it is. He's depressed. He's down. He's without hope. He's come to the end. little word that begins verse 21. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. In the most hopeless situation, the most hopeless circumstances, Jeremiah says, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every day. Morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Did you catch that? God's love, His mercies are new. Not every year. Not every month. Not even every week. Every morning. Every sunrise is a new beginning. And we experience God's grace and His love anew. Every day. Every day is a blessing. You say, well, that's great. He's God. I'm not. Great is His faithfulness. Not so much mine. How does this help me? Well, there's another promise that answers that question. It's found in the New Testament. And I'm going to be honest with you. When I first read this passage, I had to read it again because I thought I misread it. Maybe you're reading in a book and and the plot's moving and you get the sense of direction. You you think you know what's going to happen and then there's a twist in the tale. There's that in this passage. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, in most of your Bibles, you'll probably notice it's indented. It was like a poem. Some even wonder if this might not have been one of the early church hymns for the Christian church. Beginning in verse 11, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. It makes sense, right? I mean, it's just following very logically. Then he gets to the last line. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Because he cannot disown himself. Isn't that good news? You would think the way that this this poem or song is going is say, if we are faithless, God says, see ya. You're gone. I can't use you. You're a failure. No. It says when we are faithless, He remains faithful. Now He does say if we disown Him, He'll disown us. And that's an act of the will. That's repenting from God, if you will saying, I'm done, I don't want anything to do with this. At that point, God says, okay, I'll grant your wish. Our dad used to always say, you'll never see anybody being dragged into heaven by the scruff of his neck, kicking and screaming and saying, I don't want to go. 
Somebody doesn't want to go with God, God will honor that decision. But this idea of being faithless means we're trying and we're failing. It's Paul in Romans 7. I want to do what's right. It's not happening. God says that's okay. You might be weak. You may fail. You may be faithless, but I'm faithful. And my faithfulness is greater than your faithlessness. That's hope. That's what we can rely upon. That's the promise of divine renewal. Let's face it. When it comes to New Year's resolutions, many of us make them and most of us break them. I mean, they cover everything from eating healthier, working out at the gym, memorizing scripture, maybe watching less television. The simplest definition of a resolution is a firm decision to do or not do something. It's a promise, a pledge that we make. And in January, our resolutions are, they resound with determination. They offer the potential of new beginnings. And within a few months, or maybe a few weeks, resolutions merely remind us through their nagging presence that we didn't reach our goals. And by December, we probably got given up entirely. Now, whether or not you join the millions of people who make New Year's resolutions, I want to remind you that there is one who has kept every promise he's ever made. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10.23, He who promised is faithful, and he will do it. Even if we are not able to stick it out at the gym, or stay away from chocolate, or bite our tongue rather than beat others with it. God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And He has resolved that your life is going to be a great life, a life with purpose, one filled with a future and a hope. The surest way to live out your promises and to live out your purpose is to fix your eyes on the unchanging faithfulness of the One who promised that goodness and mercy will follow you every day of your life as you follow Him. That's the promise of divine renewal. But I want to conclude with the practice of daily resolve because there's still something we must do. Yes, it's true we are weak in our own selves. Yes, it is true God is faithful even when we are faithless. But we still have an obligation. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Now it is required of those who have been given a trust to be proved faithful. There's that word again, faithful. Most of us want to be faithful to the Lord. Many of us fail. At least we feel like we fail. How do we change that? Well, not to sound too cliche, but those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Many of us have a vague sense of wanting to do better, wanting to be better, but we fail to establish a plan on how to get there. So the verse I want you to take with you today is 2 Corinthians 5, 9. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. The Apostle Paul writes, So we make it our goal to please him. We make it our goal. Some translations use the word aim. We make it our aim to please him. I'm reminded of the words of the late Howard Hendricks who said, objectives always determine outcomes. Form always follows function. You achieve that for which you aim. And if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. Now, instead of making New Year's resolutions this year, I'm going to suggest that you make goals. And not just any goals. I would like to introduce this idea of smart goals. And I don't just mean intelligent ones. SMART is an acronym. Each letter stands for a word. And these are goals that we have a chance of fulfilling. 
So I'd like to very briefly go through what these are. The S stands for specific. You know, a lot of our New Year's resolutions are very vague. I want to be a better person. Well, who doesn't? But how do you know if you get there, right? I want to be more spiritual. Really? What's that look like? We need to be specific. Instead of saying, I want to be healthier, we need to set a specific goal. I want to exercise. Now, we might say, I want to exercise regularly. That's still pretty vague. We need to be specific. I want to exercise three days a week, or maybe four days a week. Maybe there's a certain goal. I'd like to ride a bike five miles three times a week. I'd like to go to the gym and exercise 30 minutes three times a week. You say 30 minutes ain't long. Go to a gym and tell me how long 30 minutes is. It's got to be specific. It has to be something tangible. We might say, I want to pray more. Pray more than what? So we have to be specific. The M stands for measurable. In order to know that we've reached our goal, there must be some way of measuring progress. We need to ask ourselves, how much or how many? How will I know when this goal is accomplished? What evidence can I give of progress? What milestones along the way can I set? As we're going to see later, our goals are going to have a deadline. They're going to be an end date. But don't wait until then to see if you're making progress. Along the way, you can set up these milestones and you evaluate, how am I doing? Maybe I'm not doing so well. If you take the time to evaluate, you can make adjustments. But make it measurable. A stands for achievable. And this is where a lot of New Year's resolutions fall apart. Our goal might be, I'm going to lose 100 pounds in three weeks. Now that's very specific. It's measurable and it's time-oriented, but it ain't going to happen. At least I hope not. That would not be a healthy way to lose weight. We might say, I'm going to run a marathon next week. Probably not, unless you're already running them. Got to be achievable. Make goals that are realistic, that can be accomplished in a reasonable time frame. What you do is you set yourself up for success, not failure. Our goals should be challenging, otherwise we get bored and we forget about them. But they still need to be realistic. R stands for relevant. What do you mean by relevant? Our goals need to align with our values and our broader objectives in life. Am I setting this goal because I think it's important or do I think somebody else thinks it's important? You got to be able to own this goal. I'm not doing it for somebody else. I'm not saying be selfish about it. In fact, that's also part of this relevancy. How is this goal going to impact my spouse, my children, my work, my church. I mean, if I obtain this goal, is it their expense? That needs to be considered. That's part of being relevant. How does my goal line up with their needs and my responsibilities to them? And then finally, T stands for time-related. You need to have an end date. That's going to provide motivation. But make sure the end date is realistic. Otherwise, we can just drag it out indefinitely and achieve nothing. Along the way, are we making progress? Maybe we're not to the end goal, but are we getting there? And if not, why not? Do I need to change something? Do I need to adjust the goal or maybe the time frame? Maybe there were obstacles. And then try again. And i got to be honest with you, this is the area where it's a real challenge for me. When you fail, 
start over. Because I know for myself, if I've set a goal, I've done this now for several years. I want to read through the Bible in a year. And I have this reading plan where every day it tells you these chapters to read. And when you're done, it, you know, you can check it off and it tells you how many days in a row you've done it. And boy, that, you know, it's encouraging. It feels really good. And then there's one day you forget. And there's that. <clears throat> now you're starting over again. My own personality, I just want to say forget it. I blew it. I'm done. And that's where the truth we've been looking at today comes into play. God's mercies are new every morning. You don't have to wait until next January 1st to start over. You can start over today. You can start over tomorrow. Every day. His mercies are new. So don't give up. Maybe you find that the time frame wasn't as realistic. Maybe your goal wasn't as realistic as you thought. Don't just quit. Keep on trying. Keep on moving forward. I want to wrap up with two passages that both come from the same book, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 gives us what I believe is the proper perspective in setting goals for the new year desiring change and growth. Paul writes, beginning in verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have been already made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What's he saying? I am moving ahead. I am going toward that goal for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to take and hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I am sure every one of you, if you haven't made New Year's resolutions, you've made some kind of promises that you didn't keep. We've all set goals for ourselves and objectives, and we failed to keep them. What does Paul say? Forget the past. Forget what is behind you. Press forward. Move ahead. Don't always be looking back. You say, yeah, but I failed so many times before. Get up and try again. Even when we are faithless, He is faithful. His mercy is new every morning. Every day is a chance to start anew. Make goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-related. Move forward. And the second verse is in the next chapter, chapter 4 and verse 13. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Now this same Paul said in Romans 7, I can't do it in my own strength, but I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Jesus said in John 15, 5, Without me you can do nothing. But here I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. His power. And a verse that just came home to me so much last year. If there was a a verse of the year for me, I think it was 2 Peter um, 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. It's there. The power is there. It's at our disposal. I think a lot of New Year's resolutions don't last because we're trying to manage our mess in our own strength. But allowing God to work through us and in us, we can do all things. In Christ, we can. 
So I want to conclude by going back to the song lyrics I used at the beginning of the message to show a new look at New Year's. I buy a lot of diaries and fill them full of good intentions. Each and every New Year's Eve, I make myself a list. All the things I'm going to change until January 2nd. So this time I'm making one promise. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's Day. I believe it's possible. I believe in new beginnings because I believe in Christmas Day and Easter morning too. And I'm convinced it's doable because I believe in second chances just the way that I believe in you. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's. This could start a revolution. Every day is one more chance to start all over. One more chance to change and grow. One more chance to grab a hold of grace and never let it go. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's Day. Maybe you won't make it through this day without breaking those promises, without falling flat on your face. Every day is New Year's. Start anew. Take a hold of His grace, His mercy. Find forgiveness and start over. It's not over. It's not finished. You're not a failure. In Christ, you are victorious. And just because we stumble along the way doesn't make us a loser. We continue to go. We continue to grow. Until that day when we're in his presence and then we'll be like him. But along the way, we continue to grow in him. So don't let your failures be fatal. Get up, dust yourself off, keep moving forward. Because every day is New Year's.